Welcome back into the Talmud. You know that word Talmud? It's a Hebrew word meaning a true disciple who desires to be what the rabbi Jesus is. And according to the scriptures in 1 John chapter 2, verse 6, let's read it. It says, the one who says he abides in him ought himself also to walk in the same manner as he walked. In the Amplified Version of the Bible, it says this in 1 John chapter 2, verse 6. Whoever says he lives in Christ, that is, whoever says he has accepted him as God and Savior, ought as a moral obligation to walk and conduct himself just as he walked and conducted himself. I want to draw your attention to an issue that I have been dealing with. Quite ironically, I, I was contacted by the brethren in the countries of Pakistan, in the country of India, in the country of the Philippines, in the country of Indonesia. Uh, Indonesia. And then I was recently talking to a group of pastors back in the United States, as well as here in Latin America, where I am in, a, in South America, in the country of Peru. And recently, the conversation, quite ironically, was about prayerlessness. Prayerlessness. What does the Bible have to say about prayerlessness? It's quite amazing to see how many believers, people who say who are their believers, absolutely have zero of a prayer life, or it's a very nominal, mediocre prayer life. So what does the Bible have to say about this? Well, one of the manifestations of one of the manifestations of what we would call spiritual atrophy. Spiritual atrophy, just like physical atrophy or, mu or, mu or muscular or, or muscular atrophy, is it's not it's not a sign of something; it's the result of something. And when we have spiritual atrophy, okay, one of the manifestations is an extremely extremely weak prayer life. This is a profound issue that is impacting the church around the world today including my home church back in the United States. And I want to address this issue in a way that I want to walk you through a lot of scripture just to remind us where we are in our walk with Christ. First of all, prayer. Prayer is the lifeblood of, is the lifeblood of a Christian's walk with God. If you don't have prayer, you're not walking with God. So let's be very direct and very clear about the subject. It means that your spiritual atrophy, okay, is, you know, Prayerlessness is caused by spiritual atrophy. Okay, it's not prayerless. Okay, it's not. And I want you to understand that. Okay, that means that you have already entered into a state of a weak spiritual faith, weak spiritual muscles, and as a result, you now are finding yourself prayerless. And that has to do with how, that you're really not walking with God. Now you talk a good game. You say this and you say that, but your life is a profound, it is just profoundly wrong to find yourself in a situation of spiritual atrophy, and you can tell because you don't pray. You just simply don't pray. You really don't know who God is, and you're going to have to straighten that situation out in your life. Look, so prayer is the lifeblood of a Christian's walk with God. Prayer, a prayer is what connects us okay, to God. Prayer is an active way to love and to connect with others. See, you need to understand, okay, that prayer also, and this is very important to understand, that prayer makes room in the prayer's heart for God's correcting voice. When you're praying, you're making room for God to deal with you. But when you're not praying, you have shut the door out to God. That's why the Bible says to pray always without ceasing, to pray continually. In first in First Thessalonians chapter five, verse seventeen, it says to pray continuously. So anything other than a continual attitude, okay, of prayer and communion with God, it is sin. It is sin. Anything other than a continual attitude of prayer and communion with God, it is sin. You need to understand that. Anything that interrupts our connection to God or leads to self-reliance is absolutely wrong. It's wrong. Now, we could look at Adam and Eve as an example. We could look at their actions. You remember that back in Genesis chapter 3? And it's, it's, it's a type of prayerlessness. Okay? They ate from the tree of the knowledge of good and evil and are too ashamed to speak with God. Remember that? They were too ashamed to speak with the Lord as he comes to move with them in the garden. And they were just simply too ashamed. They, ha they, you know, they are disconnected from God. That's, wh that's what is actually tremendous about this whole situation. They were, tr they were disconnected from God in their sin. 
that communion that, that communion and and that communion and communication with him is it, it's interrupted. So Adam and Eve's prayerlessness, quote unquote, okay, was sin, and it was caused by sin. Now, can you imagine with me? Can you imagine someone claiming to be your best friend and never talking to you? You don't think something's wrong with that? Can you imagine your best friend, the person claiming to be your fr best friend, and never, ever talks to you? Again, you don't think something is wrong with that? You know, whatever friendship was there would certainly be strained. Similarly, a relationship with God is impoverished and it is fatigued without communication. Prayerlessness is, is antithetical okay, okay, to a good relationship with God. God's people will have a natural, natural desire to communicate with their Lord. And so you're going to have to ask yourself a question. Am I part of God's people? Turn your Bibles to the book of Psalm chapter 5. And in the book of Psalm chapter 5, it says this. In Psalm chapter 5, and it's, and it's just an amazing little verse. It says, in the morning, O Lord, you will hear my voice. In the morning, I will order my prayer to you and eagerly watch. For a lot of people, even believers, God is not even in the center of their mind when they wake up. You see, the biblical command to pray are accomplished by wonderful promises that he gives to us. Let me give you an example. Turn your Bibles to Psalm 145, verse 18. It says, the Lord, he says, the Lord is near to all who call upon him, to all who call upon him in truth. Now, how is it and why is it that the Lord is not near to you? Because you don't pray. See, Christ is our best example of prayerfulness. We are his best example of prayerlessness. But Christ is the best example of prayerfulness. He himself was a man of prayer. Let me give you some examples. And tell me how busy you really are. In the book of Luke in chapter 3, it says this to us in verse 21. Luke chapter 3, verse 21. It says, Now when all the people were baptized, Jesus was also baptized. And while he was praying, heaven was open. Now you got all these people being baptized, and where was Jesus? He was off praying. And while he was praying, heaven opened his doors to him. Look at Luke chapter 5, verse 16. In Luke 5, 16, it says, But Jesus himself would often slip away, would often slip away to the wilderness and pray. He was pressed in by a lot of people and a lot of ministerial activity. But he would always slip away to do what? To pray, to talk to his heavenly Father. Look at Luke chapter 9, verse 18. Luke chapter 9, verse 18 says, And it happened that while he was praying alone, the disciples were with him, and he questioned him, saying, Who do the people say that I am? He was off praying, and he needed to know. Look at this. Turn your Bibles to Luke chapter 9, verse 28. In Luke chapter 9, verse 28, and look what it says. He says, Some eight days after these sayings, he took, he took along Peter and John and James and went up to the mountain to pray. When's the last time you invited people to go pray with you? Look at Luke chapter 11. In Luke chapter 11, verse 1, he says, It happened that while Jesus was praying in a certain place, after he had finished, one of his disciples said to him, Lord, teach me to pray just as John also taught his disciples. When, taught, his, taught his disciples. When was the last time somebody walked up to you and said to you, Teach me to pray? Now, ask yourself the question, why is it they never ask you that question? Because they don't see a prayerful person. Think about that. And he taught his followers to pray. Now, we just read Luke chapter 11, verse 1, where he says, And it happened that while Jesus was praying in a certain place, after he had finished, one of his disciples said to him, Lord, teach us to pray just as John also taught his, his disciples. Well, look at, look at verse 2, 3, and 4. Luke chapter 11. Look at Luke, verses 2 to 4. And he says, And he said to them, When you pray, say, Father, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come. Give us each day your daily bread. And forgive us of our sins, for we ourselves have also forgiven everyone who is indebted to us. And lead us not into temptation. So Jesus took the time to teach somebody else how to pray. When was the last time you taught somebody how to pray? You see, if the Son of Man, if Jesus showed a personal need to pray, this is Jesus God, 
the Son of God, God the Son, if he saw a personal need to pray, how much more should we see the same in ourselves? And yet, we don't seem to see it. You see, prayerlessness, let me tell you what prayerlessness does. Prayerlessness ignores the gift of intercession that God has given us. We are called to pray for our brothers and our sisters in Christ. That's a gift. Let me show you. James chapter 5. And you go, well, I don't have that gift. No, you do have that gift. You just don't exercise it. In, in the book of James chapter 5 verse 16, it says this, Therefore confess your sins to one another and pray for one another so that you may be healed. The effective prayer of a righteous man can accomplish much. See, Paul, Paul often solicited the prayers of God's people on his behalf. He had no problem saying, Lord, pray for me. And he told the people, pray for me. You know, do you realize how many how prideful we are? In the midst of our greatest need, we won't ask people to pray for us. Our spiritual arrogance is off the charts. Absolutely off the charts. Here was Paul. He would often ask people to pray for him. Let me show you. And I want you to see this with me. Because in Ephesians chapter 6, I want you to see this. Turn your Bible to Ephesians chapter 6, verse 19. And pray on my, and he says in Ephesians 5, 16, 6, 6, 19, he says, And pray on behalf that the utterance may be given to me in the opening of my mouth to make known his boldness in, his mystery, in, the, mystery, in, the, in the mystery of the gospel. So he said, pray on my behalf. Why are we so arrogant, so spiritually, egotistically arrogant that we won't ask others to pray for us in the midst of our need? Paul asked people to pray for him. Colossians chapter 4 verse 3. And in Colossians chapter 4 verse 3, he says this, Praying at the same time for us as well, that God will open to us a door for the word, so that we may speak for the, forth the mystery of Christ, for which I have also been in prison. Praying at the same time for us as well. Why is it we don't ask for others to pray for us? Have we become so self-sufficient, egotistically prideful, that we just simply can't, know, can't have others to pray for us? Is that what's happened? Look at 1 Thessalonians chapter 5. And in 1 Thessalonians chapter 5, he says this in verse 25. He says, brethren, pray for us. Brethren, pray for us. What is so difficult about that? See, when you fail to do that, that, that lets you know that you have already entered the stage. You're already at spiritual atrophy. It's not that you're about to go into it. You're already there. Look what he says in Ephesians 1.16. In Ephesians 1.16 he says, Do not cease giving thanks for you while making mention of you in my prayers. Do not cease giving thanks for you while making mention of you in our prayers. In my prayers. Look at this. You should be thrilled that other people are praying for you. But how are they know, what do they know to pray for you if you never open your mouth because you are so wrapped up in your egotistical, selfish pride? In Colossians chapter 1. And in Colossians chapter 1 verse 9, he says this, For this reason also, since the day we heard of it, we have not ceased to pray for you and to ask that you may be filled with the knowledge of his will in all spiritual wisdom and understanding. That's how. That's what we as a body should be doing for each other on a regular basis. You remember the prophet Samuel? Let me give you an example. Turn to 1 Samuel chapter 12. And now you're going to really like this. Okay? See, because the prophet Samuel saw prayers on behalf of the people of Israel as a necessary part of his ministry. You should be praying for people all the time. When we fail to pray, what we are demonstrating to the world and to God is that we really don't need you. I got this. I can handle this. Really? In 1 Samuel chapter 12, verse 23, it says, Moreover, as for me, far be it from me that I should sin against the Lord by ceasing to pray for you, but I will instruct you in the good and the right way. Did you hear that verse? He says, 
For, far be it from me that I should be that I should sin against the Lord by ceasing to pray for you. How many people are actually sinning because they don't pray for others? So according to Samuel, prayerlessness is a sin. Prayerlessness is a defiance toward God's command to love others. And we are not only to pray for people, okay, but we are also to pray, we are also we for, for people who are easy to pray for. We have to pray for difficult people. And we go, well, I'm not praying for sister so and so. I'm not gonna pray for brother so and so. Are you crazy, mommy? They drive me nuts. That's who you're supposed to be praying for. See, prayerlessness is a defiance toward God, toward God's command to love others. And we are not only to pray for people who are easy to pray for. No, no, no. Turn your Bibles. 1 Timothy chapter 2, verse 1. And in 1 Timothy chapter 2, verse 1, he says, For all, then I urge that the entreaties and prayers and petitions and thanksgiving be made on behalf of all men. Yes, all of those rotten politicians that are out there, all of those difficult people were supposed to pray for all men and ask for God's mercy and grace to intervene in their lives. That's what we're supposed to do. Jesus tells us that we must also pray for those who persecute us. Are you crazy? Yes. We're to pray for our enemies. He said this in Matthew chapter 5, verse 44. In Matthew 5, 44, he says, But I say to you, love your enemies and pray for those who persecute you. See, this is the message of Jesus the Christ. That is to love and support everyone with prayer, even those who are hard to love. And yet, we can't get our people to come out to pray. The most fundamental aspect of a Christian's walk is prayer. And we're just too busy. I got to run this errand, that errand, that errand, errand, you know. And, and, and we just sacrifice God and the time that we're supposed to have because we're busy running our errands because we leave our lives and not, we don't have our lives prioritized. See, prayer is not a priority in our lives. So we don't set that time aside where you have nothing else to do. And we've got 4,000 reasons why we got to go do something else. And then maybe I might get to the prayer meeting. Really? Look. Prayer, you know what prayer does? Prayer makes room for the correcting voice of God to come into our hearts. You know, that prayerlessness weakens our ability to hear Christ when he whispers. When he whispers words of correction and conviction to our spirits. He's got to scream it to it because we're not praying for him. You know, Hebrews chapter 12 verse 2 reminds us of this. In fact, turn your Bibles up. And in Hebrews chapter 12, verse 2, okay, it reminds us that Christ is the pioneer and the perfect of our faith. He's the archaico. Archaico is the word in Greek, okay? That means he is the captain. Uh, he's the captain of our salvation. He's the one who leads us through. Look what he says in Hebrews chapter 12, verse 2. He says, fixing our eyes on Jesus, the author and the perfecter of faith, who for the joy set before him endured the cross, despising the shame, and has sat down at the right hand of the throne of God. You see, without his spirit, without his spirit living in our hearts, we would be we would be on a rough road following on our own judgments. And I fear that's what a lot of us are doing. So as we pray for God's will to be done here on earth as it is in heaven, the contrariness of our own will is revealed. Look, in Matthew chapter 6, verse 10, he says, Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. When you begin to pray that earnestly, you begin to realize, okay, that all of my own will is completely contrary to his. And in Matthew chapter 26, he says this in verse 41. And, and, and what he's doing, he's offering another admonition. That's what he's doing. Watch him pray so that you will not fall into temptation, right? Well, let's read it. In Matthew chapter 26, verse 1, when he says, Keep watching and praying that you may not enter into temptation. The spirit is willing, but the flesh is weak. You see, prayerlessness clouds our hearts to the temptation surrounding us and leads to further sin. People go, well, how did I get there? Because you don't pray. We only become wise 
to the ways of our hearts through the Spirit's illumination and direction, and most of that happens in prayer. And, it is, and, and, and it's only the Spirit's power that our prayers are effective. Look what he says in Romans chapter 8. And in Romans chapter 8, he says this in verse 26 and 27. In the same way, the Spirit also helps our weaknesses, for we do not know how to pray as we should, but the Spirit himself intercedes for us with the groanings too deep for words. And he who searches and searches the hearts knows that what the mind of spirit is, of the mind of the Spirit is, because he intercedes for the saints according to the will of God. You see, prayer is our lifeline. Prayer is our connection to God. Christ showed the opposite, the opposite of prayerlessness in his walk on earth and modeled a prayer-filled life. Question, which one are you modeling? Which one are you modeling? Are you modeling a prayerful life or are you modeling a prayerless life? Which of the two are you modeling? 